And so to, as we dive back into our text, uh, we've gone through, you know, First Peter for a while, and I think this is week seven or eight. We only have a few weeks to go after this, and then we're going to be moving into a new series. It's going to be different than what I've done since I've been here. I'm excited about it, um, and we'll talk about that when we, when we get a little bit closer. But to get back to what we have today, we've seen almost three complete chapters of Peter's writing to this point. And this letter was intended for the churches and the Christians who were living in the five various provinces, if we remember. And he wrote to them to address some of the things they were dealing with, which we know was some level of persecution um, by the Roman government. And I really have appreciated this letter because when Peter wrote, it's not some like broad or generic letter of, you know, this is unfortunate that this is happening, but hopefully things will just turn around soon. But in the meantime, just keep hanging on. Like, no, Peter does, like, such a good job in this letter of detailing so many things. Like, the hope we have in Jesus despite whatever troubles or problems we may face. And nothing can or will change that. And he led the whole letter on that. So we would hear that first and foremost, and they would be reminded of that fact. And then after he talked about that hope that is still very much on the horizon for them and for us, he then shifts to basically asking, so how are we living our Christian lives? And for these Christians who are dealing with all kinds of pressure from the state, they they have had these afflictions they're dealing with, whether it was their names being tarnished, their property being seized, seized, being thrown in jail, being beaten, whatever it was, asking them, how are you carrying yourselves in this season may not have been the easiest question for them to answer. I mean, I don't even have all that going on in my life, and sometimes it's hard to answer that where I don't have moments where I'm hitting the mark perfectly in every facet of my life. And those kinds of thoughts are what we've seen quite a bit of since, I mean, really chapter one and to this point, is Peter says, okay, these things are happening to all of you right now, and I'm sure they're happening in Rome too where Peter was writing this, so he's seen all the pressures and knows what's going on too. And he says, so how are you carrying yourselves in the face of a very large amount of adversity? How have you conducted yourself in response to all the things that are going on around you? And in that, he's given a lot of advice on how we should carry ourselves on a variety of topics. He talks about how we may want to get revenge or hold resentment or talk bad or hurt others in some ways when others hurt us or when we treat people or when others hurt us or treat us badly. But he says, remember now, God is going to judge every person's work and what they do in this life impartially. And so he sees what they do. And also he sees what you do in response to those things that people do to you. And so he says, live out your lives peacefully and don't conform to the evil patterns of this world. Peter knows this world's a pretty messed up place. It wasn't designed that way, but sin and evil has made its way into the picture, and things went south from there. We're going to talk more about that next week. And so the world can and does act one way, but we're called to act in a different way. We don't carry envy in our hearts or malice and slander doesn't live on the tips of our tongues. It says those things can try to make their way to us, and it's really easy to have those things happen. We all know what that's like. Peter says those things aren't good to have weighing on our hearts. And he said they actually don't serve any good purpose for us. And then he shifted to, to, okay, so this is what we should Christians should be doing as we live peacefully in the lands that we live in. And he said a few weeks ago, submit and honor your authorities. So he said, honor the emperor, honor your governors. That would have been a tough one to hear for these individuals. But he says, just live such good lives among the people who are different, difficult, you know, around the ones who particularly don't care for you, around the unpleasant ones, and all those kinds of people. He says, over time, they'll see your good deeds and truly the good lives that you live. And over time, these are his exact words, they're going to silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Probably had some ignorant or foolish things said about us before. People may have had their opinions and things they had to say about us. But Peter says the best way to handle that is to live a good and honest life. And he says over time, that will quiet the chatter about those things people have to say about us. And he says even others are going to see your life, and they're going to know the truth about who you are and where your heart is. He said they'll take care of those things in time. So Peter's talked about how we can live in harmony in our communities, within our homes as husband and wives, and even in our church and with the people around us as fellow believers within the walls of the church and beyond. It's kind of where we're going to pick back up today is kind of seeing that advice for good living continue. And Peter's got some suggestions that are going to be helpful for us to go as we go. And he he kind of builds on this idea, but he brings in some different ideas. We're going to talk about a couple of those today. So it's interesting text that we have. So that's where where we've been. That's where we're going to pick back up. And so 
Um, we'll dive back in. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to open your Bibles, it's in verses 13 through 17. Um, if not, we will throw ahead and throw the text up on the screen, and it says this. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so as we dive into a text that we have before us, we, we have, like I said, a couple different directions that our text takes us. And we're going to go through them both as we continue along today. But the first thing we see here from Peter is a question that he has for these people reading this letter. This might be more of a rhetorical question, possibly. But he asks, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And now if we remember some of the things we know he's talked about as of recent, we saw him say, you know, be sympathetic to others, love well, be compassionate and be humble and then he says we need to get rid of any hypocrisy or envy or slander he says get rid of those things that can orbit around our hearts and he said you don't want that stuff it's not going to help you he says honor the authority figures in your area be loving be caring uh, husbands and wives in our homes and just keep doing good deeds in all aspects of our lives and around everyone that we meet and come in contact with and now if we take these words and truly live those things out well we may wonder yeah, if we do these things, who is going to want to harm me? If I'm eager to do what is right and I'm kind to everybody? Peter thinks that's a fair question to ask. Because odds are, if we're described as all these different characteristics that Peter has listed out throughout his writing, then odds are people are going to think pretty positively of you in general. If we knew, or if people knew, we were the person in their life, we were the coworker that you could always call and I'll cover your shift if you need it. If you need something, I'm there for you. We're the friend that, oh, I had a bad day. I know I can call them and we can go out and get pizza or we can go play a video game and just talk and spend time together. If I was just the person that the family knew that like, oh, I'm in, they're having a really hard time and I know that they don't have a lot of money right now. I'm going to go drop them off a meal or whatever. If that was our general posture to all people, regardless if they were family or friends or whoever they were, and people just knew that's the kind of heart that we had towards people, then honestly, who wouldn't like us? Why would people want to have issues with us or for some reason want to hurt us? For the most part, Peter seems to think you'll get along pretty well with most people if you were to behave and carry yourself in that way. But if we notice in there, he seems to think not everyone will like you, even if you're the most wonderful and pleasant person. And regardless of what you do, there's going to be, have, there's going to be people who are going to have problems with you in some way, shape, or form. And that's what he's getting at with these individuals who were dealing with a pretty hostile community that they were living in. When, when fingers were being pointed left and right towards the Christians and the people and the authorities were literally looking for Christians to ridicule and to hurt and to blame and to have issues with, he's saying, if you can get along with everyone and people just appreciate who you are and they know you're just a person who does good deeds, you keep your head down and you don't have a problem with anybody, then he says, when they see you, they might not pick on you. They might leave you alone. They might not start trouble with you. But he does acknowledge that, hey, even if you act how you should, there's going to be people who either they don't see that or they don't care to see that. And they'll try to harm you anyway. That's a bit discouraging to hear, isn't it? Because I'm sure we'd all like to believe that if we care good will in our hearts towards people and we acted right, then other people would do the same to us. They would treat us how we treat them. If I treat you good, that would be nice if I could expect the same sort of treatment and response from that person or those people. But Peter gives us the facts this morning that that's not always going to be the case. And people can and sometimes will meet your good and give you evil back. And now when that happens, that can sting in a very real way. It can certainly puzzle us as to why it's happening. It can feel totally justified. We think, man, I, I'm not sure if I deserve what they did to me. I, I don't know why they're acting this way toward me. I don't know if I did anything wrong or if I said something to them. I don't understand why they're acting like this towards me. And maybe we don't deserve it. But what does that mean for us as we respond to what others do? Is our call to live with gentle hearts and to do good deeds then revoked? Is wrath and revenge and animosity now fair game for us because someone aimed that sort of hate towards us? No, that shouldn't change how we act based on the actions of others. But in the same token, and I will be clear, 
When I say that being a Christian doesn't mean that we're doormats to be repeatedly walked on. We need to love and be forgiving, but also if people are going to abuse those gestures we give to them as an opportunity to act any kind of way towards us, then that's not right either. And so I'm absolutely in the camp of I'll love, I will care, I will treat you well, but if you want to take advantage of that, then there might be some healthy boundaries that we need to establish in this relationship. And now that doesn't mean we stop loving them or we treat them badly back in response, but if Stan invites me over to his house every single week, if, this, if that were to happen, if he invited me over every single week, and every time I went over, every time I left his house, I stole something, after a while, he's going to say, I love you. I want the best for you. I think a lot of you. But we're going to have to start going to Chili's because I can't have you keep coming over to my house and keep stealing my stuff, right? That's not an unreasonable thing to do. And we can establish some healthy lines of how we deal with these things when stuff like that happens. And to be clear, if you ever have me over to visit or whatever, I'm not going to take your stuff. I'm just using this as a safe example. It's like, Pastor Derek says he steals stuff. I don't. Um, but <laughs> I wouldn't be standing up here. Y'all fire me. Um, but, but what I'm saying is we can maintain how we know we ought to act while still recognizing the fact that we may have to have some boundaries with some people at times. Right? But Peter is saying, so, so how would we respond when people are trying to take jabs at you and attack your character or how you work or how you are as a grandparent or how you are as a parent or how you spend your time or how you spend your money or what you do here, or what you do there, nah, 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 nah. right? People got opinions about everything, right? Because it says at that point when those happen, not if, but when those times happen, that is literally the moment we're going to be standing at a team. We'll have to choose which way we're going to go from there. Either we can stay the course of, you know, they're going to act whatever way they choose, and I'm not going to feed into that because I think they're looking for a response, and I'm not going to give them one. Or we can feed into that and start taking jabs right back at them. We can meet fire with fire. But when we do that, the doing good that we've been doing, that's gone. We've allowed someone to get under our skin to influence how we feel, how we respond, and how we behave. But Peter is saying essentially to these groups of persecuted Christians, if some Roman comes up and spits on you because of your faith, I know you're going to want to spit right back. But he tells us that if we suffer for doing what is right, then we are blessed. And now I don't know about you, but I very much like the idea of being blessed. But oftentimes we don't think of blessings in this way. In fact, it's usually quite the contrary. But if we go back to the Beatitude in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that he taught, he said things like, Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are those who are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Towards the end of that section, we see Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward heaven. So Jesus very much acknowledges the reality that regardless of how good you are and how good you treat people, there are going to be some people who are going to come to hurt you. And I mean, Jesus knows this better than anyone, considering everywhere he went, he loved, he taught, he healed, he cared for all the people he came in contact with. And it didn't take long for religious figures to see that. And they didn't like how he was going about things on the Sabbath. He didn't like how he, what he was saying when he was doing healings. They didn't like this. They didn't like that, right? And they found any reason to find issues with him. And think about this for a second. Jesus, everywhere he went, he went from place to place to place. People would flock to him. Like people would swarm him when you go to places. The Bible actually tells us that it actually became a troubling thing. Like it was hard to go to places. Sometimes he had to stay at the outskirts of towns because when he would go to the village, people would just swarm him. So many people would gather to see him and spend time with him because he was such an incredible man. That it was hard to travel. But still, there were still plenty of people in the back of the crowds with their arms folded saying, this guy's terrible. We cannot stand him. Right? Even though he didn't do anything wrong. It didn't matter. Because when people are comfortable and living in the dark and a bright light starts shining, they're going to try to cover it up. And it doesn't matter if that's Jesus or if that's you. If you have a wonderful light about you, some are going to try to cover that up, and they're going to do what they can to extinguish it, and they will hate it. That's our warning today as we try to aim to live the good life that Peter is inviting us to, is knowing there is going to be resistance at some points. But Peter says you will be blessed if you keep on living the way Jesus taught you to live. And not just by the words that he spoke, but how he showed us to live. 
And he says, don't fear their threats that they make towards you. Don't be frightened by the things people do. But he says, just keep your heart towards the Lord. And I think Peter thinks if we can just keep our eyes focused on who God is calling us to be today, then we'll be all right. That God has called me to be this kind of spouse, this kind of parent, this kind of friend, this kind of relative, this kind of coworker, this kind of stranger. And if I can do those things well today, I'm good. If I do those things tomorrow, then I'm good, right? It's oftentimes tough not to lose that perspective when things are pushing our buttons and when we feel the, feel the heat of our frustrations in a given moment. But if he says, we're, if we're suffering for just living how we should, then we should know God sees that. And your patience and your mercy and your continued righteousness will not go without reward. But we know it's hard. C.S. Lewis says it best that we truly don't know the strength of an evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. I think it's really good. When you're doing good, we know God sees it. But he's not the only one watching. Because the enemy is going to see that cut and say, oh, no, 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 we got to do something about this. That's what he does. We may already know this, but when the devil was sent down or really thrown down to earth, you know he didn't go by himself, right? Oh, yeah. He took angels along with him. He pulled them down too, because that's what the devil tries to do is pull down God's creation. He'll do that to us too if we allow it. Martin Luther has a famous quote. I probably shared with this, this with you before. I really like it. If I have, it's been a while ago. But this is Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but the theologian. And, and this is what he said. For where God built a church, there the devil will also build a chapel. I think it's really good. And I truly believe these words because if we're seriously trying to stay on the path of righteousness and following God with our lives, I do believe that evil will try to sliver its way onto our path to throw us off our path just like it did in the perfect garden. He can literally throw wrenches into good plants and still somehow make them look enticing as he does it. Evil is crafty. But we should know it only serves to hurt us and to take our eyes off of the one who wants to help us live a good life. So we should keep our eyes focused on God while staying on guard to protect our minds and our hearts from any evil tr that tries to pull us down. Because, and I know it's true, there will be blessings for us if we do them today and down the road. And then after he says that part, he kind of shifts gears a little bit because he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. That's a little bit of a different topic than, hey, if you're suffering from doing what is right, then you're in good shape. But this was something that he, we talked about a little bit a few weeks ago, and Peter was right on with this. And that was if, you know, these people faced all these different afflictions and persecutions, and regardless of what came their way at their jobs, at the marketplaces, wherever they went, and they truly stayed committed to always living a God-honoring life, he said, and he, he was right on with this, but he said, if people see over time how well you carry yourselves, and they can see that you have this God-given wisdom, and you've been uh, guided by this, and it's carrying you, and how you do things, Peter was convinced that after a while, people are going to start getting curious about that. I mean, the natural response the people of the community expected of the Christians was to revolt against the Romans. They're surely going to fire back. They're going to become bitter. They're going to lash out. They're going to slander. They're going to swear. They're going to carry on and do all of those things. And I'm sure that people thought, you know, the Christians are acting this holy and righteous way right now before the persecution started. But when they started to happen around those places. I'm sure that people thought, well, that was all fun and games before, but now we're really going to see the Christians' true colors. We're going to really see how those holy and righteous people act all of a sudden. You know, now all these things are happening. Actually, the people did. But those true colors actually looked the same after the persecutions as they did before. Nothing changed for the believers in those areas. And I think that was in part of letters like we have here from Peter and the fact that they came together and leaned on one, one another during a very, very hard time for the church. But ultimately, who they were in Jesus wasn't dependent on what was happening today or what may come tomorrow. And honestly, that's a deep kind of faith that some of these people probably saw jail, beatings, public ridicule, displacement, and all kinds of things like that. And they still said, my hope today isn't from a lack of pressure from these people, but it's in Jesus alone. That's something pretty special. That's the kind of faith that we aim for, that my walls may shake, but this house in my life isn't going to fall because Jesus is still holding this thing together. And so Peter knows 
if the people in those lands are going to be watching the Christian, which he knows they're going to be. He knew people were going to be watching. He, he knows if you live this good life, then people will eventually say, all right, well, how have you not retaliated? Like, how have you not spoken badly about these people? And honestly, how have you been able to keep your head up during all of this? Peter says, be ready for that time because you want to have a response ready to give those details of the hope that you have. Because everyone around them is going to be confused because there's no question when they saw what the Christians were going through, they would say something like, man, you must be feeling pretty hopeless right now, right? I saw you have your stuff taken from you. They wouldn't accept your payment because you're a Christian. They did this to you. They did that to you, whatever. I feel a little worn down, if I'm honest, maybe. But no, I don't feel hopeless. That's not the feeling that I have. And when people would ask, how? How is that possible? Peter says, be ready to dial up words like Psalm 121 that tells us, well, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And just as Peter talked about in the very first words of this letter many weeks ago, he said that through the death and resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we are given an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. So there was a very real opportunity to evangelize and talk about Jesus to all of these people who came asking the Christians how they've managed themselves so well. And now we should note this wasn't a whole crowd that got together and asking, you know, the Christians, what gifts? Now, they were probably asking, you know, this individual, right, that they worked with, right? And because over time, they saw the good fruits that come from living a godly life and that this wasn't something they were just talking about, but the hope they spoke of was literally evident in their lives. And the neighbor would see, and the people down in the marketplace would see, and the friends and the relatives and so on and so on. And honestly, there's two amazing things that are so true about this story. And that is, one, these people had such a strong faith that they could li- people could literally witness and visually see their hope in the way they carried themselves. That's pretty amazing. Two, because these Christians carried themselves in that way and shared Jesus like Peter said to be ready to do, we see down the road from these things, documented and proven numbers, showing that the Christian faith continued to grow despite the efforts from the Romans. It's pretty amazing that even when this world was trying to put out that Christian fire and extinguish that light, the Christian said, nope, I'm not changing up who I am regardless of what you do. And I'm going to show off Jesus in my life by how I live. More people came to know Jesus because of that. The faith in that, those areas grew and grew. And that wasn't just because they were, the Christians were having babies. Because people were coming to know the Lord in bunches left and right. The good news of the hope that we all share was making it to the hearts of so many. That can happen today too. But the, the Bible tells us we need two things for those to happen. We've already talked about them a little bit, but those things are that people have to see our hope, we have to have a reason. And that really shouldn't surprise us a whole lot as we hear these words, because honestly, if you weren't a Christian, let's say for the sake of the example, you weren't a Christian, but you knew one, right? Let's say you worked with them or something, right? And you go up to the Christian and you say, hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a little bit. How you been? Uh, another lousy day, isn't it? Just another day of work, another day closer to death. If we heard something like that as an unbeliever, odds are we're probably not going to be asking about that hope that they have. In fact, we may be wondering, where is your hope? At the only time we speak of hope is when we're saying things like, well, I hope gas prices go down. Well, I hope we get a better president. Well, I hope my boss takes a job out of state because I can't stand seeing his face. People aren't going to see the real hope that we have if we do that. That goes beyond any wishful thinking and the things we'd like to see happen right now. And people should be able to see in us that we have a hope and faith that Jesus Christ is going to have a room prepared for you and me in his father's house in paradise when this short life is over. I think we would all agree here today. I think we'd all agree that we believe that Jesus is going to be waiting for us up in heaven to greet us and welcome us home once we close our eyes for the last time here. I think that's a fair statement. If we truly believe that, and we have that eternal hope coming for us, then nothing today can change that. And we shouldn't lose sight of that hope. I know it's hard not to lose sight of that when we have no idea when that time is going to come. We we don't know how much time and how much sand we have in our hourglass. I understand that. And if we have problems staring us right in the face today, 
Hope can feel way off in the distance. I completely get that. But we should think of life like a movie that we know the ending to. Because when I watch movies with my daughter, there are times when, you know, when we're watching the movies, there, there's parts of sadness and there are stress, right? And when those happen, she'll come up to me and she'll go, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, because that's what she does. It's very cute, but it's sad. And so she'll come up to me and she'll do that. And I'll say, it's, it's okay. It's going to get better. And I don't, just, I don't just say that to make her feel better. It's because I've seen most of the movies she watches, and I know how the story ends. And through every story, every life, there are ups and there are downs. And I don't know where you're feeling at right now at this moment, but one thing I can tell you with absolute confidence is that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you got a good ending. Because your ending here isn't the end, it's only the beginning. And so I know you have a hope. And though it's tough to feel some days, I hope we can always go back to that fact because God's promises are good and they are true. And the second thing Peter tells us today, which we have to have a reason. Now, for me, I grew up in the church going home. I, I was involved in church-related activities two to three times a week when I was young. I went to a private Christian school where I could be taught Bible lessons from the classroom. And since I could walk, I knew about God, and, and church was a part of my life. But if you were to ask me when I was a teenager why I believed, I couldn't have told you. And to be honest, I wasn't saved. I, I, tru I truly hadn't accepted Jesus in my heart. I went to church, I served, and I did all those things because my family did, and that's what I was supposed to do. But if you know my story, I had a period where I ran off like the prodigal son, knowing all the stories and the promises, but taking that inheritance and running with it. And I did come back, obviously. When I did... I felt God's love and forgiveness pour over me. And when that happened, I dug deeper. I got into his words and I studied them. I wanted to know about all these words that I'd heard about since I was a kid. I wanted to understand them. And what I found was what many, many, many millions of people have over the course of the last 2,000 years. And that is, these words are absolutely reliable. They are reliable. I mean, you can look back at the beginning of the universe, and you could know nothing comes from nothing. I used to watch a show on the History Channel. It was called The Universe. I'm not sure if anybody has ever seen that show before. It's not on anymore, but it used to be. And it, w it did studies of the planets and those sort of things. And in the introduction of that show, it says, and this is a quote. You can go on YouTube and watch this. That in the beginning, there was darkness, and then bang. All we have in existence. And I'm not going to go on and on about this because I've talked about this last month. But it takes intelligent design to have order in creation. I'm still waiting for a Ferrari to drop from the sky and fall in my yard. Has not happened yet. But I'm waiting. Now. <laughs> life doesn't come from non-life. And so that's one thing that's always left me wanting to further study. The next thing was, when I studied these texts, that I, I noticed, yeah, this was written 2,000 years ago. I, I understand that. But when I read the words, they were incredibly detailed of where Jesus went and what Jesus did as he went there. We've done a slow walk, and I mean a slow walk, in our Wednesdays and our Bible studies. We've spent eight months in the Gospel of Mark. I think it's been that long. Summer's like, it's been longer. It hasn't. <laughs> um, but we've, we've taken our time. We've gone week to week studying through the Gospel of Mark, and we were able to see that, oh, Jesus went from Capernaum, then he crossed the Sea of Galilee, then he went to the Decapolis, then he went to Bethsaida, then he went down to Nazareth, then he went down to uh, Tyre, and then he went down to Sidon, and then he went, all, he went here, there, wherever, and it's place after place after place, and you can actually verify the history of the words with what we see there today. I mean, we've talked about this before, but Peter is literally writing this letter just shortly before the Colosseum was being built. The Colosseum is still standing today, Right? We've talked about Roman persecutions quite a bit in this letter. You can go to sites today and see where the Christians would meet together under homes. They had these like kind of like basements that they would build, and this wasn't entirely commonplace. They thought of a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different meeting places that they had, but one of them that you can see is they would build this like uh, basement, a secret basement where it has like this, it's kind of off to the side, and you can go down. It wasn't a finished basement. It wasn't nice, but they could meet there secretly in people's homes, and it had a little exit too, because you don't want to have a basement that has one way up, one way down. They had a little tunnel that would take you somewhere else, right? Because the Romans were trying to stop their meetings, and so they were trying to seek them out and all those sort of things. I mean, and you can see those things today. Like, I, there's so much evidence that we can see that verifies so many of the things we've talked about in this writings. The history literally backs up what is written. Lastly, 
people witnessed Jesus' death and resurrection, it wasn't just a few friends. Over 500 people witnessed. And Paul, who wasn't a follower of Jesus while Jesus' earthly ministry took place, he wrote to the Corinthians and said, many have saw Jesus rise from the dead, and many of them are still alive. So it wasn't just a take my word kind of thing. He's saying, yeah, there's plenty of people who went and saw him. You can go ask him for yourself if you want. <laughs> you know, it's kind of amazing. Many saw the truth for themselves. And not only that, many of the disciples, even Paul, I, I love Paul. So even Paul, formerly a Jewish uh, religious figure, he gave up his nice job to talk about Jesus. And he took beatings and was whipped. He wrote a lot of what we have in the New Testament. And he quit. As a Jewish religious figure, he quit his job. He used to go around in and persecute Christians. Now, he wasn't beating and taking people into jail and doing those things himself. He had a crew with him. He was the leader of the pack, so to speak. So he wasn't swinging that hammer himself, so to speak, but he was waving his hand at that. And he, he knew better than anybody the dangers of being a Christian, better than anybody would have. Why in the world? He, had, he was educated by some of the best in those days, educated by some of the best. He would have had a job, status. Everybody would have looked at him with some sort of esteem. He would have had some money in his pocket. Why in the world would he have left that to become a persecuted Christian? Because what he saw was true. Jesus came to him and changed his life. Not for a lie, but because of what he saw. And many died for what they saw. When people said, you better stop saying those things about Jesus, the Christian said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep talking about it until I can't anymore. And people said, well, we'll kill you if you don't stop talking about it. The Christian said, so be it. As long as I have two feet on this ground, I'm going to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you right now, people don't go to their death for a lie or something they made up. They knew what they saw. And they knew Jesus' words were true. And so if we're sitting here this morning, and we're thinking, I'm not, I'm not sure about my answer or my reason I can give, I would invite you to dive into those questions that you have a little deeper. I know there are a lot of good questions out there. Not every single question can be answered. There's a level of faith, right? But there are a lot of good questions out there. Jesus has a lot of good answers. They're there. And so remember, when you're trying to do good, evil will be prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But someone's going to be there to help you with that, always. Jesus will be there to comfort and give peace in any seasons. So always lean into him. And don't lose sight of that hope that you have today and the hope that you have on the horizon. Jesus tells us there can be troubles here on this earth, but there is power in the name of Jesus and nothing can or will overtake him. And he's got you. So trust him today and always. And let us close this time singing to him because we know we got a hope we're singing about this morning. Let us pray as we close this morning. God in heaven, we thank you so much for the words that we have been given and all the things that you have done for us. God, in this broken world, it's hard not to get wrapped up in all the stuff that goes on around us. And God, we know we need you. So help us resist the evil that tries to get to us. And help remind us that these things are just trying to wage its war on our souls. But God, with you, we know who's going to win. There is power in the mighty name of Jesus, and in you we know there is victory. So may we keep giving you more of ourselves, trusting you with all we got. God, you know the right ways for us. And may we follow them with joy in our hearts and a hope knowing where, where, where we're going to be at the end of this journey. God, we look forward to that. But help us to see what you have for us today. Help us to not let any evil damper the beauty of this day that you have made this week. God, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. But may we end today with praise on our lips and praise on our hearts. Because God, you deserve it all. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
For those who are able, would you please stand for a last song of worship? As we leave this place, Peter wanted us to hear 
not just some wise words, but that God's got hope for you today. So how are we going to use that this week? Will people be able to see that as you go? I pray that we can say yes to that. And if they do, if they ask you about it, will you be ready to have an answer? And as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you each and every day that you live. And may his peace cover you. Let us pray as we leave. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together here. I thank you for every person in this place today for their hearts and desire to want to learn more about you. God, we ask that you be with all of us. Give us peace and comfort on our toughest days. And we pray that we'd always seek you in our troubles. And God, in this time, we lift up those who have things going on that we don't know anything about, God. You know what those things are. And we ask that your presence would be felt in their lives. God, give them rest if their souls are weary. And God, help us to walk closely with you this week. Help guide our steps as we aim to follow you. God, we love you. And we need you for everything we do this week. To keep your word on our hearts. And keep us safe until we're able to meet again. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thanks for being with us this morning.